Hi, I'm Peter Burris, and welcome to Wikibon's Action Item. Every week we bring together the Wikibon research team and we present the action items that we believe are most crucial for users to focus on against very important topics. This week I'm joined by George Gilbert, David Floyer, here in the Cube Studios in Palo Alto, and on the phone we have Ralph Finos, Dave Vellante, and Jim Kabilis. Thank you guys, thank you team for being part of today's conversation. What we're going to talk about today in Action Item is the notion of what we're calling enterprise hyperscale. Now we're going to take a route to get there that touches upon many important issues. But fundamentally the question is, at what point should enterprises choose to deploy their own hardware at scale to support applications that will have a consequential business impact on their shareholder, customer, and employee value. Now to kick us off here, because this is a very complex topic and involves a lot of different elements, David Floyer, first question to you. What is the core challenge that enterprises face today as they think about build, buy, or rent across this increasingly mushed hardware continuum or system continuum? So the, the, fun, the, the biggest challenge uh, of, from the traditional way that enterprises have put together systems is that they, uh, the cost and the time to manage these systems is going up and up. And as we go from just systems of record to uh, with analytic systems being mainly in batch mode towards systems of intelligence where the real-time al analytics are going to combine in with uh, the uh, systems of record. Um, so the complexity of the systems and the software layers are getting more and more complicated. Uh, and it takes more and more time and effort and elapsed time to keep things current. But why is it that not everybody can do this, David? Is there a, is there a fundamental economic reason to play here? Well, if you take systems uh, you and, and build them yourself and put them together yourself, you'll always end up with a cheaper system. Uh, the issue is that the cost of maintaining those systems, and even more the elapsed time cost of maintaining those systems, the time to value of putting in new releases, et cetera, has been extending. And there comes a time when that cost of delaying implementing new systems overwhelms the cost that you can save in the hardware itself. So, the, so there's some scale efficiencies in thinking about integration from a time standpoint. Now, Dave Vellante, We've been uh, looking at this for quite some time and we think about true private cloud, for example, but if you would kind of give us that core dynamic in simple terms between uh, what is valuable to the business, what isn't valuable to the business, and the different options between renting and buying yourselves. What is that kind of core dynamic at play? Okay, so as we talked about a lot in our true private cloud research, the hyperconverged systems are, are, are an attempt to substantially mimic public cloud environments on-prem. And this creates this bifurc bifurcated buying dynamic that I think is worth exploring a little bit. The big cloud players, as everybody talks about, have lots of engineers running around, they have skills and they have time. So they'll spend time to build proprietary technologies and use, you know, roll your own components to automate processes. In other words, they'll spend time to save money. And this is essentially the hyperscalers, a form of their R&D, and they have a, you know, end year lead, whether it's five, six, four years on the enterprise. And that's not likely to change that dynamic. The enterprise buyers, on the other hand, they don't have the resources, they're stretched thin, so they'll spend money to save time. So enterprises, they want to cut labor costs and shift useless IT labor to so-called vendor R&D. To wit, our forecasts show that about $150 billion is going to come out of low-value IT operations over the next 10 years and will shift to integrated products. So ultimately we end up seeing the vendors effectively capturing a lot of that spend that otherwise had been internally. Now this raises a new dynamic when we think about this David Floyer in that there are still vendors that have to return something to their shareholders. There's this increased recognition that 
businesses or enterprises want this cloud experience, but not everybody is able to offer it. And we end up then with some really uh, loosely defined definitions. What's the continuum of where systems are today from you know, traditional all the way out to cloud? What does that look like? So uh, a useful way of looking at it is to see what, what has happened over time and where we think it's going. Uh, we started with separate systems completely. Uh, converged systems then came in where the vendor put them together and, and reduced the time a little bit to value, but really the maintenance was still a responsibility. But what was, what was brought together? It was the? It was the it, traditional arrays, it was the, uh, the servers. Racks, uh, power supplies, cooling, all of that, all, all that stuff. All of that stuff put together uh, and uh, delivered as a package. Uh, the next level up was so-called hyperconverged, where uh, certainly some of the hyperconverged vendors went and put in software as a uh, for each layer, software for the storage layer, software for the uh, uh, the uh, networking layer, put in more management. But a lot of a lot of vendors really took hyperconverged as being the old stuff with a little bit fewer extra. So they, they literally virtualized on those underlying hardware resources, got some new efficiency in the economy. That's right. So they 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 software virtualized each of those components. Uh, when you look at the cloud vendors, just skipping one there, the they have gone hyper hyperscale, and they have put in as uh, Dave uh, uh, spoke earlier. They have put in all of their software to make that hyperscale work. What we think in the middle of that is enterprise hyperscale, which is coming in where you have the, what we call server SAN, we have that storage capability, we have the networking capability, and the, uh, the uh, uh, CPU capabilities all separated, able to be scaled in whatever direction is required, and any processor to be able to, to uh, get at any data through that network with very, very little overhead. And it's software for the storage, it's software in, and in firmware for the, uh, for the networking. The processor is relieved of all that processing. We think that architecture is going to mimic what the, the hyperscale have, but the vendors now have an opportunity of putting in the software to emulate that, uh, that cloud experience and, and take away from the people who want uh, on-site equipment, take away all of the work that's necessary to keep that, that software stack up to date. They are going to maintain that the vendors are going to maintain the, that software stack as, as high as they can go. So, uh, David, is this theory or are there practical examples of this happening today? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there are practical examples of those happening. Uh, there are practical examples at the, the low, lower levels uh, with people like Micron and Solid Scale. Uh, people like That's the technology level. Yes, when the technology level. When we talk about hyperscale. But, well, if you're looking at it from a, from a, a, a practical uh, point of view, Oracle have put it into the marketplace, uh, Oracle Cloud on-premise, Oracle uh, Converged Systems, where they are taking the responsibility of maintaining all of the software all the way up to the database stack, and, and in the future, probably beyond that, uh, to, towards the uh, uh, Oracle applications as well. So they're taking that approach, putting it in, and, and arguing persuasively that the customer should focus on time to value as opposed to cost of just the hardware. Well, we can also look at SaaS vendors, right? Sure. Who are, who have, many of them have come off of infrastructure as a service, deployed their own enterprise hyperscale, increasingly starting to utilize some of this hyperscale componentry yeah. as a basis for building things out. Now, one of the key reasons why we want to do this, and George, I'll turn to you, is because, as David mentioned earlier, the idea is, we want to bring analytics and uh, analytics and operations more closely together to improve automation, augmentation, and other types of workloads. What is it about that effort that's encouraging this kind of a adoption of these new approaches? Well, databases uh, typically make great leaps forward when we have um, 
uh, changes in the underlying trade-offs or relative price performance of compute storage and, and uh, networking. And um, what we're talking about with hyperscale, I guess either on-prem or the cloud version, is that we can build scale out that databases can support without having to be rewritten so that they work just the way they did on sort of tightly coupled sym symmetric multiprocessors, shared memory. And so now they can go from, you know, a few nodes to maybe or a half a dozen nodes or, or even say a dozen nodes to thousands. And as David's research has pointed out, we, they have latency to get to memory in any node from any node in five microseconds. So building up from that, the point is we can now build databases that really do have the horsepower to handle the um, analytics to inform the transactions in the same database. Or if you do separate them because you don't want to touch a, a current system of record, you have a very powerful analytic system that can apply more data and do richer analytics to inform a decision in the form of a transaction than you could with traditional architectures. So it's the data that's driving the need for a data rich system that's architected in the context of data needs that's driving a lot of this train, just changed. Now, David Floyer, we've talked about data tiering. Uh, we've talked about the notion of primary, secondary, and tertiary data. Without revisiting that entirely, what is it about this notion of enterprise hyper-converge that's going to make it easier to naturally place data where it belongs in the infrastructure? Well, it, it, uh, underlying this is that moving data is extremely expensive. So you want to, where possible, move the processing to the data itself. Um, that that the origin of that data may be at the edge, for example, in IoT. It may be uh, in in a, a large uh, central uh, uh, headquarters. Uh, it may be in the cloud. It may be for oper operational data that or, uh, uh, end user data uh, for people using their phones, which is available from the cloud. So there are multiple sources. So you want to place the processing as close to that data as possible so that you have the least cost of both moving it and you have the lowest latency. And that's particularly important when you've got systems of intelligence when you want to combine the two. So, Jim Kabilis, we've talked, it, it, it seems as though there's a compelling case to be made here to focus on time, time to value, time to deploy, on the one hand, as well as another aspect of time, the time associated with latency, the time associated with reducing path length and optimizing for path length, which again has a scale impact. What are developers thinking? Are developers actually going to uh, move the market to these kinds of solutions, or are they going to try to do something different? Um, I, I think what developers will do is that they will begin to move the market towards hyperconverged systems where you know most of the development, I'm overstating, much of the development that's going on now is for artificial intelligence, deep learning, and so forth, where you're building applications that have an increasing degree of autonomy, being able to take decisions based on system of record data, system of engagement data, system of insight data in real time. What that increasingly requires, Peter, is a, is a development platform that combines those different types of data bases or data stores also combines the 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 processing for deep learning machine learning and so forth um, on a on a on devices that are increasingly tinier and tinier and embedded in like mobile devices and whatnot. So that what I'm talking about here is a, is an architecture for development where developers are going to say um, I want to be able to develop it in the cloud. I'm going to need to because we have teams, huge teams of specialists who are building and training and deploying and iterating these in a cloud environment, in a centralized modeling uh, context, but then deploying their results of, the, of their work uh, down to the smallest systems where these models will need to run, if not autonomously, in some uh, coupled fashion, loosely coupled fashion, with tier two and tier three um, uh, systems, which will also be hyper-converged, and each of those systems and each of those tiers will, will need a self-similar data fabric uh, 
and, and, a, and an AI processing fabric. So what developers are saying is I want to be able to take it, model it essentially, and deploy it to these increasingly nanoscopic devices at the edge. And I, and I need each of those components at every tier to have the same capabilities in hyper, in, in hyper converged form uh, factors, essentially. Or hyperscale, so, so uh, we've got, so here's where we are, guys. Where we are is that there are compelling economic reasons why we're going to see this notion of enterprise hyperscale emerge. Uh, it appears that the workloads are encouraging that. The developers seem to be moving towards adopting these technologies. But there's another group that we haven't talked about, Dave Vellante. The computing industry is not a simple go-to-market model. There's a lot of reasons why channels, partnerships, et cetera, it's so complex. How is, how are they going to weigh in on this change? Yeah, well the cloud clearly has, is having an impact on the channel. I mean, if you look at sort of the, the channel guys, you got this, so the sort of box sellers, which is still comprises most of the channel. You got more solution orientation, and then increasingly, you know, the developers are becoming a, a, a form of a channel. And I think the channel still has a lot of influence over how customers buy. And I think one of the reasons that people buy roll your own still, is, and it's somewhat artificial, is that the channel oftentimes prefers it that way. It's more complicated. And as their margins get squeezed, the channel players can maintain uh, services and, and, and on top of that, those roll your own um, components. So I think buyers got to be careful and they got to make sure that their service providers' motivations align with you know, their, their desired outcomes and they're not buying, you know, doing the roll your own bespoke approach uh, for the wrong reasons. Yeah, and we've seen that a fair amount as we talk to senior IT folks, that there's a clear misalignment often between what's being pushed from a technology standpoint and what's, uh, what the application actually requires. And that's one of the reasons why this question is so rich and so important. Uh, but Ralph Finos, Kind of sum up, when you think about some of these issues as they pertain to where to make investments, how to make investments, from our perspective, is there a relatively simple approach to thinking this through and, and understanding how best to put your money to get the most value out of the technologies that you choose? I think we've lost Ralph there, so I'll try to answer the question myself. <laughs> um, so here's, here's how we would look at it, and David Floyer, help me out and see if you disagree with me. But at the end of the day, what we're looking for is we're suggesting to customers that have a cost orientation should worry a little bit less about risk, a little bit less about flexibility, and they can manage how that cost happens. And the goal is to try to reduce the cost as fast as possible. And not worry so much about the future options that they'll face in terms of what, uh, how to reduce future types of cost out. And so that might push them more towards this public uh, hyperscale approach. Absolutely. But for companies that are thinking in terms of revenue, that have to ensure that their systems are able to respond to competitive pressures, customer needs, that are increasingly worried about buying future options with today technology's choices. That there's a scale, but that's the group that's going to start looking more at the enterprise hyperscale. Clearly that's where SaaS players are. Yeah. And then the question is, and what requires further research is, where's that break point going to be? So if I'm looking at this from, a, from an automation, from a revenue standpoint, then I need a little bit greater visibility in where that break point's going to be between controlling my own destiny with the technology that's you know crucial to my business versus uh, not having to deal with the near-term uh, costs associated with uh, doing the integration myself. But is there a but this time to value, I want to return back it, to this time it's, to value. It's time thing. to value that is the crucial thing here, isn't it? Um, if, uh, if time to value now and time to, to future value. value. And, and, uh, and time to future value, yes. Um, what is the consequence of doing everything yourself is that you, uh, the time to put in new releases, the time to put in patches, the time to make your system secure is increasingly high. 
Um, and the more that you integrate systems of, uh, of into systems of intelligence with the analytics and the systems of record, the more you start to integrate, the more complex the total environment, the more difficult it's going to be for people to manage that themselves. So in that environment, you would be pushing towards getting systems where the vendor is doing as much of that integration as they can. And They're that's where they get the economies the from. They get the, the vendors get the economies of scale because they can feed back into the system faster than anybody else. Rather than taking a snowflake approach, you're taking a volume approach, and they can feed back, for example, artificial intelligence in operational efficiency, in, uh, in security. There's many, many opportunities for vendors to push down into the, the marketplace those findings. And those, those vendors can be um, cloud vendors as well. If you look at Microsoft, they can push down into their Azure stack uh, what they're finding uh, in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of capabilities. They can push those down into, into the enterprises themselves. So the, the more that they can go up the stack, into the database layers, maybe even into the application layers, the, the, the higher they can go, the lower the cost, uh, the, the lower the time to value will be for them to deploy applications using that. All right, so we've very quickly got some great observations on this important dynamic, it's time for action items. So, Jim Kabilis, let me start with you. What's the action item for this whole notion of hyperscale? Action item, Jim Kabilis. Uh, yeah, the action item for hyperscale is to con consider the, the, the degree of convergence you require at the lowest level of the system, the edge device. Uh, how much of that needs to be converged down to a commoditized component that can be flexible enough that you can develop a wide range of applications on top of that. Excellent, Hardware okay, without... hold on, okay. George Gilbert, action item. Uh, really quickly, you have to de determine, are you going to keep your uh, legacy system of record database and add like a an analytic database on hyperscale infrastructure so that um, you're not doing a, a, a heart and lung transplant on, on an existing system. Uh, if you can do that, then, and you can manage the latency between the existing database and calling to the analytic database, that's great. Um, then there's little uh, disruption. Otherwise, um, you have to consider integrating the analytics into a hyperscale ready uh, uh, legacy database. David Vellante, action item. Tasks like LUN management and server provisioning and just generally infrastructure management are non-strategic. So as fast as possible, shift your IT labor resources, quote unquote, up the stack toward more strategic initiatives, whether they're digital initiatives, data orientation, and other value-producing activities. David Floyer, action item. Well, I was just about to say exactly what Dave Vellante just said. So uh, let me uh, focus a little bit more on uh, a step in order to get to that position. I think so, it's... So Dave Floyer, action item. <laughs> <laughs> so the action item that I would choose would be that you have to know what your costs are and you have to be able to, as senior management, look at those objectively and say, what is my return on spending all of this money and making the system operate? The more that you can uh, reduce the complexity, buy in uh, converged systems, hyperconverged systems, hyperscale systems that are going to put that responsibility onto the vendors themselves, the better position you're going to be to really add value to the bottom line of applications that really can start to use all of this capability, uh, uh, advanced analytics that's coming into the marketplace. So I'm going to add an action item before I do a quick summary, uh, and I'm just going to assert it. Uh, my action item, the relationship that you have with your vendors is going to change. It used to be focused on procurement and reducing the cost of acquisition. Increasingly, for those high value, high performing, revenue producing, differentiating applications, it's going to be strategic vendor management. That implies a whole different range of activities. And companies that are going to build their business 
with technology and digital are going to have to move to a new relationship management framework. All right, so let's summarize today's uh, action item meeting. Uh, first off, I want to thank very much George Gilbert, David Floyer here in the studio with me, David Volante, Ralph Finos, Jim Kabilis on the phone. Today we talked about hyper enterprise hyperscale. This is part of a continuum that we see happening because the economics of technology are continuing to assert themselves in the marketplace and it's having a significant range of impacts on all venues. When we think about scale economies, we typically think about how many chips we're going to stamp out or how much, uh, how many copies of, of an operating system is going to be produced. And that still obtains and it's very important. But increasingly users have to focus their attention to how we're going to, how we're going to generate economies out of the IT labor that's necessary to keep the digital businesses running. If we can shift some of those labor costs to other players, then we want to support those technology sets that embed those labor costs directly in the form of technology. So over the next few years, we're going to see the emergence of what we're calling enterprise hyperscale that embeds labor costs directly into hyperscale packaging so that companies can focus more on generating revenue out of technology and spend less time on the integration of work. The implications of that is that the traditional buying process of trying to economize on the time to purchase, uh, the time to get access to the piece parts, is going to give way to a broader perspective on time to ultimate value of the application or of the outcome that we seek. And that's going to have a number of implications that CIOs have to worry about. From an external standpoint, it's going to mean valuing technology differently, valuing packaging differently. It means less of a focus on the underlying hardware, more of a focus on this common set of capabilities that allow us to converge applications. So whereas converged technology talked about converging hardware, enterprise hyperscale increasingly is about converging applications against common data so that we can run more complex and interesting workloads and revenue producing workloads without scaling the labor and management costs of those workloads. A second key issue is we have to step back and acknowledge that sometimes the way products go to market and our outcomes or our desires do not align. That there is the residual reality in the marketplace that large numbers of channel partners and vendors have an incentive to try to push more complex technologies that require more integration because it creates a greater need for them and creates margin opportunities. So ensure that as you try to achieve this notion of converged applications and not converged infrastructure necessarily, that you are working with a partner who follows that basic program. And the last thing is I noted a second ago that that is going to require a new approach to thinking about strategic vendor management. For the last 30 years, we've done a phenomenal job of taking cost out of technology by focusing on procurement and trying to drive every single dime out of a purchase that we possibly could. Even if we didn't know what that was going to mean from an ongoing maintenance and integration and uh, risk cost standpoint. What we need to think about now is what will be the cost to the outcome? And not only this outcome, but because we're worried about digital business, future outcomes that are predicated on today's decisions. So the whole concept here is, from a relationship management standpoint, the idea of what relationship is going to provide us the best time to value today and streams of time to value in the future. And we have to build our relationships around that. So once again, I want to thank the team. Uh, this is Peter Burris. Uh, thanks again for participating or listening to our the action item from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto, California. See you next week.